During the summer times, it was a good time because we used to herd sheep all over the land. We had sheep camps, you know, like summer camp, winter camp. So during the summer, we we take our sheep up into the mountains, and all summer long, we'd be up there building fires, herding sheep. And then beneath the mountain, we had a cornfield. Every other week, we'd go down and, you know, help my mom weed the garden. We had a big field, like probably two football field sized cornfield. And we irrigate it and we play all summer long there. And by the end of the summer, by the end of the summer, she would say, you know, gather all the corn, so bring it up under the tree. We, we had an adobe, a big adobe. We fix it up, we build a fire early in the morning. We build that fire in there and we keep it going while we gather all the corn. And we put the corn in the, in the adobe in the evening time put out the fire and put all that corn in the adobe and seal it. We put like 40 gallons of water in there. All the melons that we didn't pick, we throw in there and we seal it. We seal it, we leave it overnight. And when the morning dawn comes, about 4.30 in the morning, my mom should come over and pick us up, get us up and say, it's time. We go over there, we, grew, we did that each year and one year, I remember we went over there and we stood there at the, behind the adobe facing the east. And she says, one of you boys go climb up there and open it. So my little brother climbed up there and he opened the hatch on top. When he opened the hatch, the steam came out. The steam came out and, and she says, that's your laughter. So this, that's your tears. So all your happiness. So that's, I heard it all summer long while you guys are, you know, working the field. So that's all that good feelings. So it's going back into the sky. So next year it w it will come back as rain. So this is how I was taught. She says. And so we're standing there wanting to go back to bed, and. We took out the corn and she sat down. She sat down and says, um, I want to ask you boys something. So we sat there and listened, listened to her. And she says, so imagine a corn, a single corn standing. Said, think about it. Said, if you can see it. Said, don't tell me how you see it. Said, I'm going to tell you a story. She said, if you can see this corn standing in your thoughts, in your mind, so you can see, you can see it waving, its tassel moving. He said, "Go up to it." He said, "Go up to it and touch it." He said, "Can you feel it?" He said, "Can you smell it?" He said, "Can you taste it?" He said, "Go walk around it." He said, "Counterclockwise, walk around it." He said, "Look at it." We're sitting there. We're we're seeing this corn. You know, we're doing this with our thoughts. And and then she says, so that's my story. I said, if you can do that with your mind, so I imagine you could accomplish anything you could think of. So it was a very good learning thing at a, at a young age to 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 become aware of what we are capable of. To be to be dreaming somewhere else. In a, in a spirit world or whatever, and still function here and communicate in two worlds. So that's, that was my understanding, what she told us. And years later, my grandma told me the same story. She said, we, we have a gift. She said, we can travel, live somewhere else while we're living here. She said, can you see yourself? She said, yes. And so how do you see yourself? She said, I'm sitting right in front of you. He says, you're right. He said, take care of that. He said, it'll take you long ways. It goes into many, many realms, you know. All, all these things that happened in my life, it's part of the emergent story that was um, told to me. How the corn came and how it was planted. All, all the animals on the earth, you know, the trees, the sky, the fire, 
how the fire is a is actual an entity like a being that that we can communicate with or the moon you know the stars like when we were kids my grandma says those stars you know said it goes forever I said she goes everlasting life I said we live in the light I said this is this one big light a stream of light so if you close your eyes, it's dark, but if you keep going, so you'll see light. And she was right. You know, when you think about it, it's maybe this whole thing is just a big stream of light. All these stars forever. She goes, it's everlasting life. So there's life throughout the stars forever. So that's what your grandpa told me. So my grandpa told me. And so I'm telling you now. My great-grandpa, his name was um, Hastin Kutsili. So, in translation, is um, broken ruin, broken ruins. That that was his name, and he was a he was a medicine man in the Four Corners area for probably back in the 1800s. And he raised uh, my my grandma's brother, his name was Jimmy Clark. Raised him, <clears throat> raised raised his grandson, and you know, after that he would. His grandson went into the U.S. Marines. U.S. Marines and laid down the language and said, this is how it's spoken. He said, he said we only need a few dialects to, to confuse everyone. So the language was um, pretty, pretty important. You know, in our, in our language, we can say something, you know, like a couple words. We can explain a whole a whole story almost, or a paragraph. That, that language is real hard to learn. It, like the traditional people knew that. I imagine it take a lot of education to, you know, to come to that state to understand something like that today. But people a long time ago, they, they knew that. And, you know, that's what they used in World War II. Like on the code talker symbol, you know, the, there's symbols on there it's a symbol of the sun gods, you know, like um, telepathy, the, the language, that mind, mind language. Those symbols are on there. So all this stuff starts, makes me, just, makes me start thinking, you know. So I went to school and, you know, space is like only this big. I said, my grandma says it goes forever. You know, I have all these questions and even about language, you know, it's like, we can speak in so many ways, so many ways. When I was a little boy, my grandma was talking. She was talking with her sister. They were talking behind, you know, behind, kind of behind a curtain. And I was listening to them, and it woke me up. It sounded like music. It sounded like music, and I woke up, and I peeked through the curtains, and it was my grandma's talking. They're talking to each other, and it sounded like music, and it it kind of like I, I stood there and just listening, listening, listening. And years years down the road, I realized, you know, they were talking to each other so beautifully that it sounded like music. So I learned I learned from that, you know, if if you say good things, beautiful things to people. It is beautiful language. It's a beautiful language like music. You say something, you hear something real good from someone that's, that you just take in. You know, you can start, you hear it and you feel it, and you taste it. Everything just goes off in your body. Those are the things that um, I've learned in my, my cultural. You know, I, I became an artist. I learned a lot, a lot of things expressing my art. I came, in, I came to Chicago, lived here f five years ago. And, you know, I've seen a lot here, and I've met a lot of Native Americans. We, we come together at times, and, you know, we, we spend time, times together and sharing stories. I have a lot, of, a lot of friends from different tribes, all good people, and they, we all have the same language the same stories in the emergence, the creation story. 
Like I'm, I'm part traditional and I'm part Andrew. So the traditional side of me is like, I shouldn't be mentioning, you know, the emer emergent story because there's no snow out there. But the Andrew side of me is, wants to talk about it from what he knows. So the emergent story is a story about, you know, humans emerging from the earth to where we are. There's a, there's a story that I, it, I pondered for a long time. It was, um, it was a story about changing woman. A changing woman is a woman that like the, the northern people talk about, like the white shaw woman, white buffalo calf woman. Changing woman was like, in the, she, was, um, she was a woman, half spirit and half human. It was a long time ago when people emerged from the earth said people were trouble here, said people were trouble. So why people were trouble was when, pe when people was in Mother Earth, when people were living in the Mother Earth, man and a woman got in a fight. They told each other, said, I, I can't live without you. And there was children involved. There was children involved and they disagreed and they were they split by a river of fire. They, got, they split by a river of fire and they separated. The woman was on the other side and the man was over here taking care of their, their kids. Their kids and um, they lived and lived and you know they, and then pretty soon it got, it got really strange because the dis disagreement, they, they took the female and male apart they took it apart, and it's um it's a story about you know it made me think, but this is a a Dine, true you know like it was told to me <clears throat> at four, three years old. It said man and woman split, so there was a river of fire between them, and I said they they realized after a while that they couldn't live with one another. I said the man couldn't take care of the child by himself because he didn't have, he couldn't feed him or had that, um, that feminine to take care of the baby. Except for there's a, there's a gay, gay people, so those are the ones that carried the children for the man, took care of him. So when it got really, really strange, the man went to the gay people and the woman made out with the animals so that's what happened and you know a long time ago when when there was a disagreement so when people came out life wasn't wasn't you know wasn't happening because here on on earth it was the humans were trouble you know that they wouldn't it wouldn't grow human hum, the human race wouldn't grow there was monsters here on this on this plane, and and the the monsters, um, they call them, you know, the the children of the sun. No, not the children, the animals of the sun. I don't know why they call it that, but the reason why the monsters, big um, animals that were eating people, running around the earth, and my grandpa says those said those are dinosaurs. He said, they're dinosaurs. He said, that's why, you know, the human race wouldn't grow. He said, because the dinosaurs were, were right there eating everybody else. He said, the reason why the dinosaurs were happy, he said, we created it. He said, we created it when, during the disagreement and what we did in the disagreement. So, you know, I thought about it when I grew up. I thought about that, that part, that story. It's like you disagree and you create something. You create something for the future. You don't agree with something, you're, you know, you're, you're creating something in the future. I think it's true. If you're open, humble, in a good way, the future's good. So those, those are the teachings that I, I've learned, you know, that story of man and a woman disagreeing and going their own ways. 
go into our own ways and did their own thing, created monsters on earth when they came out. It's like they, they manifested in, in some way and so the people got together when, when all this stuff was happening on earth. They said a woman was born on the earth. They said there's this big lake they said, every morning, there's a person called the Talking Dawn will go up to the mountain and pray to the lake up on top of the mountain. So each morning, every morning he went, and then one morning he realized that the lake was shrinking. And he went up there every day. It took him like four days. He said, that lake shrunk. So on the third day, it was like a pond. He said, it was like a shape of a, a human. So on the fourth morning, it said it shrunk into a little baby. So it was a woman. They called her changing woman. And so they took her back into the village, and she grew up as a woman. And back then, people were half holy people, half spirit people, and half human. So she became a woman, and you know she was living here on Earth, and. She, she got pregnant and she brought these two twins in. There's um, these two twins that were born. The reason why these two twins were born is because of um, all the chaos on earth. When these two twins grew up, they became young men. And they asked their mom, they said, Mom, who's our father? Changing, wo changing woman wouldn't answer. And then tell like a few days later, they asked again. She wouldn't answer. They asked her four times. Then finally she answered, and she says, "I want you, I want you boys to get up in the morning, and watch the sunrise." So they both got up in the morning and watched the sunrise. Watched the sunrise and realized who who their father was. So the father was the light, the sunlight. So that was their father. So they went home and told, told their mom and said, we want to go see our father. She said, okay. I said, he lives a long, long ways and he's really mean. She goes, I said, you, you can't travel. I said, you can't travel the way you are. I said, if you want to go see him, I said, you have to get ready, prepare for it. So... The little boys understood about the sunlight, how you know they accepted the sunlight. So just that little story, that part right there, waking up in the morning, go check out the sunlight. To me, it meant enlightenment. It meant enlightenment. So these little boys had to get enlightenment and ascend into a different realm to travel. To travel, you know, like no other like travel like the mind so that's what that that was my understanding and years later i went back to my grandma and asked her this I said is this true she goes yes and said don't you realize that emergent story the whole story is just about enlightenment so it's about accepting whatever happens and you know always be um positive to always be positive about things that no matter how hard it gets. He said that's called walking in beauty. So those are some of the some of the things that I learned from from the stories that I grew up with. Even even with the animals, like I rode a lot of horses, you know, Mustangs. We rode a lot of horses when we were kids. I learned something from there, you know, like, I, I learned that, you know, how the horse moves, how, how it c communicates with you, how it runs, how that energy flows, and, you know, it's right there. It's, you know, you're communicating. If you can feel that, that horse moving like that, you're communicating with it. It's like you feel the wind out there, the tree. If you feel a certain way, it's that like you're, that's communication. So a horse taught me how to how to listen, 
how to listen to a footstep of a person. You listen, you know, listen to how a person walks. A person, you can hear a whole story how a person walks. It's, um, it's like music, you know, it's who they are and where they come from. You can almost hear it. I learned that from a, from a horse growing up. Those are some of the stories that I've, um, I learned and I like sharing with people. I, I've been an artist for about 20 years. I've been um, I've been doing that for 20 years, making a living out of my art. I'm a sculptor. I play music. I make Native American flutes. I do storytelling. I made my my living like that. It all it all started from a from a dream. My my flute making, my flute playing came from a dream. When I was growing up, my my grandpa told me a story about a flute. I was probably about three years old. We're sitting on the, up on the mesa and he spoke to me, you know, in our, in our language. He said, son, he said, I bet you can make this. And he was drawing a flute in the sand. As he was drawing it, you know, the wind was blowing so it was just covering it up. And I was listening to him and I remember the name. He goes, Dijne. When we got home, we started to make one. And then something came up and we had to leave and we never got back to the project and I forgotten about about the flute till I was like 19 years old till I was 19 years old I I had a dream about a flute I had a dream about a flute and um it's a it's an interesting um dream the dream was um I was walking through a canyon and I passed this little juniper tree. You know, it was like, there's like a little wash on the bottom of the, the canyon. I crossed that wash and there's a juniper tree standing there. And someone came out behind it and called my name. I turned around and it was, it was myself, you know, like 50, 50 years later. I was looking at him and he's a lot older, but you know, I was looking at myself. And he says, I got something for you. And he gave me this flute, old beat up flute, wooden, like it was half, looked like a fire stick. And he gave it to me, he said, I want you to play it. He said, just put your, he said, put your air into the hole. So I did that. And I said, it sounds good. And he gave it back to me, he gave it back to me. And he says, no, I want you to really play it. So I stood there and um, I played it again. I played it again when I played it again, that that sound, that whistle sound, took me up into the, the sky, the day sky, it was blue. We went up so high to where the day sky met the night sky, and there was a house floating up there. And we entered this house, and in the middle of this, in the house there's a room, and right in the middle of the room there's a tapestry laid out, and there's all these different kinds of flutes made out of crystals, corals, turquoise, it was just like beautiful artwork. I was standing there looking at him. I was looking at him and I thought to myself, I don't think these are from Earth. These are from somewhere else. So I was looking at all these beautiful flutes and I saw an old wooden flute, like that, the one that guy gave me. I picked it up and I looked at it. So, oh, this is like the one that guy is showing me. So I played it again, stood there in that house. I played it again. When I played it again, I went inside the flute. I put myself inside the flute. So I stood inside the flute looking down a tunnel, looking down this tunnel and the sound hole was just right on above me, like a chimney. I was standing there, you know, there's no sound, nothing. I was just listening. I was just listening, not even thinking. And as soon as I thought, so wow, the, this is a gift. I can I can have whatever I want, you know. My ego my ego popped up, and I woke up. So what what the dream the, the dream meant to me was you know, the flute is its own thing. The flute is its own self. It's not. 
I, I have this flute not because uh, I want something. You know, the flute came to me to keep it, to keep it and carry it. So the flute's his own thing. I, you know, I cannot ask something for the flute, like something that I desire or something. It's just, it's an instrument. Like I'm an instrument, you're an instrument. Same way, having respect for it that way. We came com to communicate with it. I started communicating with the, the flute. There's a long history. I realized there's a long history in, in my culture about the flute, how the flute was used. You know, the flute, some of the oldest flutes were found in the Four Corners area, like the Anasazi people, like Zeke. Zeke's people, you know, they're flute people. There's certain people that are flute people, flute tribes. The first flute was, you know, it was just like um, a, a rim blown. The hole went all the way through the, the flute. It wasn't in chambers, it was like one flute. Those, those are the flutes um, of the Southwest and it traveled. It traveled up north and out east and it changed. It's like when a person moves, they change. It changed, changed into different chambers and went all the way out east and back around. That's a um, little bit of the story of the, the flute. You know, the flute came way south, way south, South America. You know, it came up from that way somewhere through the trait routes. So the flute was used in a good way by the spirit people a long time ago. Today you hear a lot of flute stories about you know the Native American flutes to um, to to play for women, you know it's like I don't know about that you know I don't think that I have a story for it. You said the flute was used. The flute is made for the the human mind, the human body. So a long time ago, the human race, the mankind, humankind was um. It got lost somewhere, and people got confused, and they're, they're, they're living in, in a strange way. And the spirit people, they got concerned. They got really concerned and because we didn't communicate with the spirit people. We don't understand the spirit people. We can talk and pray to them. But if one came up, we wouldn't understand their language. So they used that flute. They played that flute to, to wake up. You know, humans, so humans came back slowly from a dark time and they realized, you know, so we have music, we have music and they started going in a good way again. So that's how the flute was used a long, long time ago. You know, it's just a myth, but I think it's a cool story. So the the spirit people, um, they have a different different language, probably the same language and energy, but we we cannot, our minds cannot go that far, or we cannot we cannot accept ourselves to open up with to all that information of communication. So we call them yeas, yeas like, you know, that so we don't understand the spirits that we don't understand. I mean, to come down to it, we don't, we don't really understand how to communicate. People say we don't. They said this is, that's part of life here. That's how we were born. It's a, this, to experience this life is to separate, to separate and try to go back. So that's the gift. So my grandma and my grandpa told me those stories about the flute and the emergence. And my mom was a big influence. My mom was, um, she grew up, she was born in the desert. She was born in the desert and um, she was a preemie. She was born real small, like the size of my hand. She told me the story one time. And she goes, when I was about four years old, so my mom died. I said, your great grandma took me in. She said, I took care of your grandma, your great grandma. That she was mean. So you think I'm mean? That she was mean. That she taught me how to weave. Said to do weavings, Navajo weavings. Said she taught me the story about Spider Woman. So what? What's the story of a weaving? 
I looked at her and I was, I said, I know something. He said, all them um, strings that come down that, like that, he said, it's the sun rays coming down. And said, you, you are thinking in the sun, you're living your life. I said, you're weaving, you're weaving your life right there. She goes, that's right. I said, I didn't have to tell you. I said, how'd you learn? I said, I've been watching you and, you know, listening to, to the shuttle, to the comb. As, as you, you weave every morning, me laying there as a child. So all this stuff, you know, I realized, you know, what the sunlight is and for us to live in the sun. So that's the story of uh, weaving, you know, my part. But my mom's part is um, they, they dear those stories because it's so, it means so much to them because everything is taken away from them. Their grandmas, you know, they went to the long walk. You know, my great-great-grandpa signed a treaty so people can go to school. That's the only reason why we, get, we got released from the long walk in Fort Summers. Because people said, yes, my, my children will go to school now. They'll learn. Said they'll learn, learn how to live. So they signed their names and they were released. That was on um, Metalito, um, his Navajo name, a, his name was Black Sage, Black Sage Creek, and that was, that was his name. So th there's a story that, that my mom told me about the long walk, what happened in the long walk, you know, all the horrible thing, the genocide and all that stuff. We said how people were gathered and how Families were just, you know, s separated. People being killed everywhere. Everybody watching. He said, "Your great grandma walked down there." He said she was 12 years old and she walked on that lo long walk. He said on the way, you know, she she carried her grandma. He said she cut off her fingers to feed her people. It's because the U.S. military wouldn't feed the people when they were walking in this cold weather. So the women, they cut off their fingers and they fed their people in this cold, cold winter to make it all the way to prison. So they carried their people, they carried their dead, you know, the hurt. They, had, they all helped each other as a unit. And they walked and they walked and they walked. So all the soldiers were crying because they didn't understand how people could do this that the women were cutting their fingers, feeding their people. Got to prison, they put away their dead, and they sat in prison for seven years. So while they were sitting in prison, so my great-grandma so went out, out of the fork, and she gathered wool from the Spaniards herding sheep around, Mexicans herding sheep around the fork. And they spun them, they spun, they spun the, the wool that they brought in with whatever fingers they had and they wove, they wove small weavings like that. They, they wove small weavings and they sh shared stories. They said this, is, said, this is the picture of my land. This is where I come from. So that's the actual story where the different patterns of um, the weavings, the Navajo weavings actually originated. Like T-Snuts bus pattern is the, one of the original, I think, Two gray, two gray hills in there. But some of those, some of those are really to have those kind of stories that really originated the the art part of it, the different styles originated in prison. So when they signed the treaty, my grandma, she had like two kids by then. And they took one child, one grandma. She had two girls and they took one grandma. She stayed behind and she, we don't know where that lineage went, but she brought one one child back. But as they as they were leaving, my grandma went over to the Mexicans herding sheep and traded her um, weavings for some sheep. She traded the weavings at here, said maybe a milking goat, and took that sheep back all the way back into the four corners. 
And to this day, you know, that, that, same, that same line of sheep will only have very little. My grandma, my mom, they still have them. And they still use that weaving, that wool, that story to weave and, you know, to feed their, their grandkids and to tell stories. But when she told me that story, she goes, I don't want you to be mad, mad about it, what happened. He said, your great-grandmas, your grandpas, said, they all suffered for it. He said, it's already been suffered for. He said, don't suffer for it. So I just like sharing that story because um, it was, it's an inspirational story to me because it's, um, it's, my, it's where I come from. It's where I come from, and I, it inspires me to do art, music, to tell stories, to help someone. You know, that's the story that that helps me today. So anyway, I'd like to thank um, Doreen and the uh, University of Chicago for putting, making this thing happen and to, to be in the space and to, to share stories and, you know, just to be. So I want to say thank you. Yeah. Andrew, thank you for sharing your stories and, and your, your knowledge and your Navajo tradition. Thank you. Yesterday, my sister reminded me that our ancestors would be watching over this conference today. And I can tell you that with the way things went today, they are smiling. I want to give a big thanks to all that participated in the conference today. Dr. Fixico, thank you very much. To our panelists, thank you for your knowledge and sharing. To the Black Hawk Performance Company, Andrew Begay and the Spirit of the Southwest Caterers, thank you. Also, for those of you who have not had an opportunity yet to fill out the evaluation sheet, please do so, and you can turn it in at the registration desk on your way out. Um, also, the artisans are over here, and they will have their wares available for purchase until about 3 o'clock today. It is my hope that we can continue this collaborative effort to continue having conversations necessary to improve the educational opportunities and access for urban American Indians. <clears throat> my father always taught me, my father is 100% Seneca from upstate New York, living on the Cattaraugus Reservation. And there was a mantra that my family had that he taught us. And I'm gonna leave you with his mantra and I hope that you will carry it with you throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout the year, throughout your life. Face the sun, pray hard. Remember, pain is temporary, but glory lasts forever. Nyawe is Seneca, thank you.